Hey everyone. One of the things that I'm doing right now is drawing music related pictures for subscribers on my Patreon. And to get the ball rolling on Patreon, I decided to give away some of these drawings to the first five people that subscribe at the $1 per month level and the $3 per month level. And so that's what I'm doing right now is drawing one of these drawings for one of my subscribers, one of the first to sign up. Now this one is actually for my own mother. Um, and so I'm decided to tone down some of the aliens and monsters that I usually like to draw and just draw something nice. I was thinking about a, she's, she likes moms and daughters and pictures of those things. So I decided to do maybe, um, a, a piano instructor teaching a little girl how to play piano. And the vision I had at this point was to draw a little girl on the bench playing with her hands on the keys and then the piano instructor next to her reaching up and pointing at um, something on the page of music. And so right now, I'm just, I, I decided to go with kind of a 1950s setting. I just like that era. I enjoy drawing those types of people with that hairstyle and those outfits. It's an era that I like. I always use references. And that's the nice thing. If you know how to draw in 3D space, um, you can just find a picture and then it, using your imagination and the principles of 3D, you can rotate that in any direction and move it around in any shape and so what I'm doing here is just looking for some hairstyles looking for some uh, outfits that I like um, and then I'll take that and I'll put it in my drawing poser how I want um, maybe change this and that if I think that I could do a mashup of two different pictures if I wanted maybe put one girl's hair on this model and then another girl's outfit on this model I get references for almost everything when I draw a serious picture. Sometimes I like to just draw from my imagination, but when I try to to draw a scene, um, especially from an era, I'll I'll get any references from what does a piano look like to what does a table look like to what is their living room decorations to, you know, what kind of cars did they have, what kind of outfits did they wear, and try to get it as authentic as I can. I don't always, always, always do this because sometimes I just like to draw from my imagination. And generally, I do know what things look like. I have a, an idea of what a piano looks like, but it does help to give references. Usually what results is a lot of tabs open in my browser. <laughs> and I look for a picture of a little girl from the 50s. So now I'm going to start drawing something. I want this to fit in an envelope, so I've got an envelope here, and I'm just going to kind of size these frames out so that I know how big my drawing can be. I'm using, um, because I'm going to mail these out and I want them to hold up and not get wrinkled or bent out of shape, I'm using a watercolor paper, which is not great for drawing on because it's got kind of a bumpy texture, but it's what I had, and um, I like I like the thickness of it. I'd feel confident that I could mail it out without it getting messed up. And the other thing is, um, I'm using, I'm going to be using ink pens and I don't want the ink to get smudged or smeared around or anything, so watercolor paper seemed safe to me. It's a 90 pound paper. My favorite type of pencil to use when drawing is, um, they're, they're Tombow pencils. If I was doing a, if I was doing a render drawing where it was almost lots of more realistic shading and things, I would use a whole, a whole spectrum of pencils from, you know, up to, from, from 4B to 4H basically. But if I'm just going to draw a picture, I'm happy to just to keep it at a HB or a, or an F or a, you know, a H1. I really like Uniball Vision Elite pens. I've tried some more high-end drawing expensive pens and I keep coming back to Uniball Vision Elites because they're not that expensive. You can buy them in bulk and they're so easy to work with. They're pressure sensitive. You know, you can make a thick line by pressing harder or a thin line by, you know, letting up on the page. They don't really leak. They don't last a whole long time before they kind of dry up, but that's okay because they're relatively cheap. You can buy them at Costco or get them online. So I start drawing my frames based on the sides of this envelope. And I actually made the mistake when I drew this, as I found out in the end. I, I filled the frame and then I thought, wait, I'm going to have to trim this to actually fit it inside the envelope. So for this specific drawing, I may end up having to get a bigger sized envelope. My bad. 
but for future drawings, I'll try and leave a, a kind of a margin so that I can trim it down and fit it inside the envelope. My favorite type of eraser to use is this Papermate Pink Pearl. It doesn't have to be Pink Pearl, but I like the shape of this type of eraser. And I like the way that it's got the, the corners, the edges, and and then br I can do broad, broad erases or very specific erases. A lot of people like kneaded erasers, and they're fine. I just don't really like how putty-like they are. I like my eraser to be pretty stiff and um, immalleable, <laughs> I guess. Before I get started, I have an idea of what I want the image to look like, at least with the girl and the teacher and the piano. Um, but I'm going to sketch out a few uh, angles and try and get an idea really locked down in my head of where do I want the camera to be focusing in this drawing. So you can see here I've got the little girl at the piano, just loose sketches. I'm going to draw the teacher next to her. And, and I'm just thinking to myself, this is just one... This is just one idea, one camera angle that I could use. I'm thinking the teacher's going to have one arm outstretched pointing to the paper on the... pointing to the music book on the piano. And then she's going to have one arm down on the bench that she's leaning on as she's kind of leaning forward. So there's the pages of the book. There's the piano structure. So this one would be looking at them from behind. And I like the idea because you can see the piano, you can see her pointing at the page, and you can see the keys, but you can't really see their faces, and you can't see the little girl's face. So those are the pros and cons of that angle. This one would be facing the student and the teacher, so you're looking directly at them from the front. And it's kind of at a downward angle, so you're looking down, seeing the keys below, and the book coming up at you. So you can just see the front of the pages of the book, and you can see the, her hands on the keys. The downside is then you don't get much of the environment. You're basically pointing the camera right at the floor. And so to fill this whole canvas, you're not. I'm not going to have much to fill the space of the canvas unless I draw toys all over the floor or uh, a pattern on the, ru the carpet. I don't know. So I don't know about that angle. This is the angle that I was pretty happy with because you get to see the piano keys. You get to see both of their faces from the front. You get to see the teacher pointing at the um, the pages of the book, and then there's a it's a it's low the camera is low enough that you can see the background, so I could draw more of an environment around them, with the house or or wherever they are. I did try one more, and this is kind of a wide angle bubble effect, almost like a fisheye view. So I I kind of warped this perspective here, and I was trying to get it so that you could still see their faces, still see the piano keys but see more of the front of the piano and more of the pages of the book. And I, I do like it, but the only downside is that the perspective warping, for one thing, it's hard to draw <laughs> and, and get it to look right. And for another thing, I want this to be kind of a fly-on-the-wall scene, and sometimes if you warp the perspective so much, it doesn't feel like you're looking in at them. It feels almost alien, almost like you're looking through the eyes of the predator or something. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I I just thought, did it really fit the mood of the of the scene? And I'm I'm not sure that it did. In the end, I decided to go with the second to last pers perspective, where there was no camera warping or anything, but it was kind of showing the back of the piano a little bit. But you could still see that there was a book. You could still see her pointing at the page, see the piano keys, see the front of their faces. I liked that. The only the only thing I ran into as I was imagining this is where is this piano? Because generally people butt a piano up against a wall if it's an upright piano like this, so that it uh, you know you don't want it to tip over or something. And the back of the piano isn't that nice to look at, so you generally you know you butt it up against a wall. And if I did that, I'd have a wall where I want my camera to be. And so I decided to go with it. Um, because I liked the angle and I liked what you could see of the environment. And I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to put the piano in the middle of the room. And that's just the way it is. I guess for the, sto for the sake of the story, I guess I could just say that's what this piano teacher wanted. She just wanted a piano in the center of the room to teach her students. As I'm drawing this piano, I do have some reference images on my laptop that I'm looking at. I just got an upright picture of a piano so I could kind of see the design, the the way it was built, the curves of it, the the ornate structure. And this one's going to be pretty simple, pretty simple blocky looking piano. 
And the, well, the one I was looking at, the picture I had was from the front. So later I had to get a different image to draw the back of the piano. And I ended up kind of, you'll, you'll see, but I kind of shade the back of it. So you can't really see anything. It just looks like a blocky structure. When I draw the girl, oh, I'm not great at drawing children. I, I'm not always super confident about it just because I haven't done it a lot. So generally I just draw a an adult human, but with shorter proportions and I keep the head just about the same size because I want the head to look bigger compared to the body. I just kind of shrink all the limbs and everything, make it look like a short. And then, and then I, I do round, rounder uh, features on the face and rounder body. They're not as built or muscular or chiseled or anything. They're just kind of, just kind of straight and round. Unless it's a, you know, you could do an obese child or something you do differently. But just for my standard body, I would make them. Just kind of a plain body, but with shorter limbs. Almost all of my ability to draw people I learned from Andrew Loomis. He has some fantastic books. He was a um, <clears throat> a marketing illustrator from the 1950s, and he was in the business of doing commercials and stuff. So the the forms, the body forms that he teaches you in his books are idealized. Not a lot of obese people, not a lot of ugly people. They're all kind of model -y looking. But you learn from his books, um, just kind of the skeletal structure, at least, of, of people and the general proportions and how to get everything aligned properly, and then how to put them into 3D space. And so from that, you could draw average looking people, different looking people, um, extreme looking people. But he generally starts out with... Um, this idealized version of people when he teaches and you can go out from branch out from there I was having a little bit of difficulty getting this teacher in here because the perspective of the arm I pictured it being outstretched and pointing at the page but she's sitting a little too close in this image and I, I just decided to adapt and so in, I couldn't quite get it so instead of having her with an outstretched arm pointing at the page I ended up just having her kind of with her, her arm coming around bent at the elbow and holding on to the book like she just turned the page or she just set it up or she was trying to hold the page from flapping open, which I've experienced many times as I've played piano. Sometimes you just got to roll with the punches and if, if a drawing isn't going quite how you originally imagined it, you can try and force it or you can just adapt and say, oh, I'll just do this instead. Maybe this will look better. I'm using a couple different images for the mother, two or three, um, not the mother, the, the, t the piano instructor. Um, I had one for the hair, maybe two for the hair, I can't remember. And then I had one for the outfit to, to design her shirt. And then I had one, I think I had one for the face. I might have used the same one for the hair as the face, but I just kind of combined them all into one person. And the little girl, I, I used a couple. I liked one little girl's head and her hair, so I, I used that as reference. And then I liked another girl's outfit, so I used hers for the outfit reference. So as I went along, I kind of started to like the, the instructor and the student and the piano right here smack dab in the center because they were the center focus of my drawing. But then I thought, I've got all this extra space and I have to decide... Where are they going to be? And if I was doing a fancy illustration, I would probably try and work this all out ahead of time. But this was supposed to be a quick sketch. And I did it all in about an hour and a half. Um, so I kind of made some decisions on the fly as I was going along. So I decided that I want this to be in the instructor's house. And so I would just draw a living room around them. And then I thought, well, I want... I want to add some interest so it's not just furniture in an empty house. So I thought I would put the little girl's mother over here on a couch and then maybe add a baby brother on the floor or in her lap or something. So I started kind of fleshing that out. I got references on the internet for what a 50s couch would look like. And I'm kind of putting it into perspective. If I Again, if I was doing a fancy illustration... I would do all these vanishing points and lines and, and try and get everything perfectly in perspective as best I could. But with this one, I'm eyeballing it a little bit, to be honest. And I do kind of have an imaginary vanishing point in my head. I can see where the lines kind of converge. But um, the couch isn't perfectly aligned with the piano. I kind of bent it over and I'm just 
I'm just trying to eyeball it and, and asking myself, does it look natural? Does it, is it believable? You know, if somebody just looks at this, are they going to be like, ooh, this perspective is all out of whack? Or are they going to be like, nice picture, you know? And so that's what really what I was focusing on for this hour and a half drawing. It's just a kind of a quick sketch. So now I'm drawing the mother and her, I do the basic skeletal structure and then I put some kind of geometric shapes in perspective on, on top of the, sort of the skeleton. I don't do it exactly like I learned from Andrew Loomis books. I kind of took what he taught and then I made an, a method that works for me. And that's really what drawing comes down to is what works for you? How does your brain think? How can you get it to look the way you want it to? And that's pretty much what I've done. For the mother, I'm using... I'm trying to remember. I think it was two different images. One for the face and the hair, and then and then one for the outfit. And the face and the hair, I actually found a, a lady that had kind of a circular hat on her uh, right on the top of her head from the like a 1950s hat and I decided to go with that because what I found was that as I was drawing them I, I started to think they all look similar the little girl's got this hair that rolls out on the sides kind of shoulder length the teacher has this hair that's similar and so if I wanted to do something different for the mom so I decided to put the hair up in, in a bun or something and then put a hat on top of her head and she's a little fancier I'm gonna give her a nice coat um, that I found on the internet and, uh, and then make her look like she's out, she's out running errands and she's, she's trying to look nice in town. I decided to have her sitting on the couch reading a magazine or a book or looks like a magazine. And then I was going to draw the baby on the floor, the toddler, and I just found one on the internet. There was a pretty good one, just a single image, um, of a baby in, uh, a hat and, this cool outfit and so I kind of just decided to go with it again not a direct copy or anything like that but I'm just taking the look of the baby and putting it on my own skeleton that I've posed that I've put in my 3d environment and that's really what references are all about when I draw babies it's a little bit like children because I'm not that confident about drawing babies I haven't drawn a ton of them so my general idea when I go into it is to just draw Almost like a, <laughs> almost like a kidney bean or something. There, there's not a lot of skeletal structure to show because babies are generally chubbier. And so I just kind of draw like a beanbag baby in a way. It's like a beanbag human with small features, a big head. I try to remember the proportions of a child that, you know, they can't, their arms are so short, they can't really reach their arm above their head, you know, um, like all the way over really short proportions and just lots of fat. I just kind of make them lumpy. And the difference between an adult and a baby is that on an adult, you can kind of see the, if they're, if they're fit or thin, you can kind of see the joints sticking out like a bulbous shape on the, on the elbow, or you can see the definition of the bones underneath. Whereas with a baby, they're almost like sausages. You, you, you actually indent the joints rather than showing them. A baby doesn't have a knobby looking elbow. They just, their fat kind of bulbs out and then it kind of goes down in where it attaches to the bones underneath. So it's a little bit the opposite of a, of an adult human. And you give them more rolls, of course. As I started to draw the living room, I decided to just look at pictures of 1950s living rooms because I thought, I don't really remember what they decorated with um so here i just found a bookshelf the the camera is kind of angled downward which i went for because i wanted to see the piano keys um but it doesn't leave a lot of room for decorations around the living room you're just kind of looking down at the floor was that a wise decision i don't know it's really your preference i guess because there is going to be a lot of empty space of white space where the floor is and i could put a throw rug or something but um one thing i do like about it is that everything is silhouetted from each other so in the center you've kind of got this floating island of a piano and you can see the eye the eye goes right to the center of the page and looks at the teacher and the student and then off to the right you've got the mom and the baby completely separate by this separated with this white space and then on the other side you've got this big living room window and this bookcase 
and everything is kind of separated from each other so that you can look at them all individually. None of it really overlaps or gets um, in the in the way of each other. So in that regard, you could say, yeah, it was a wise decision if that's what you want. It really just depends on what you want your drawing to be. I thought if I do this great big open window in the living room, then I can show beyond the furniture. You can actually look out and see life outside. And I also liked it because it helped the piano make sense. Um, in the 1950s, perhaps the lighting in this house and the electrical wasn't quite as bright as what we have today. I don't know. But if you have this natural light from this big old window, it would make sense that you'd want to put the piano right in front of it so that students can read their pages and see the, everything clearly. I mean, maybe. It really, it's just an argument to kind of explain the story of my drawing, but it's an hour and a half sketch. It's nothing serious, so it could just be that that's the way it happened. I don't know. I decided to put a tree outside so that it really looks like outdoors. I don't want any confusion. I don't want people to think, is that a painting on the wall or anything? I want it to be clear. This is a window. This is looking outside. And so I put a big old tree right outside the window. As another reference to the 1950s, I decided to put one of those classic looking 1950s um, metal tricycles right outside the window. And it also kind of insinuates, it tells a bit more of the story, like, this piano instructor probably has kids of her own, which is probably why she's able to work with kids and teach them piano, because there's a kid's toy right outside her window. Could be a neighbor left it there, but I would imagine it 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 belongs to her kids and she might have kids of her own. Maybe she pushes them into the other room when, when she's teaching a student, says, go play outside or go play in your room. <laughs> Don't bother us. As I was looking for things they'd have in their living rooms in the 1950s, I thought, oh yeah, a great big um, upright radio, and I like the look of it. So I can, I don't have a lot of room to, to fit it into this picture, so I just thought a radio is recognizable enough and kind of iconic that you could just draw the bottom half of it just peeking out of the frame, and people would be like, okay, 1950s radio. Here's a close-up of the drawing. It's all coming together pretty nicely right now. The couch to me looks a little bit angled, um, like it's not quite in line with the room. And it's a little odd because I, you know, it's not butted up against the wall. The wall looks like it's, you know, a little ways back off the frame on the right side. And so why is the couch there? I don't know. Maybe it's a listening couch for when they're waiting around or listening to the piano be played. This whole thing is a little, it's a little odd. Um, but like I say, it's an hour and a half sketch. I'm just trying to cram it all in. If I was doing an illustration, I probably would have done pre-sketches and really try to get this thing locked down for what I want it to look like and have it all make sense. But for this little panel, I just thought, I want to just tell a story, get it all in there, and be done. And that's what I love about... I, I kind of have to do that for me because... A lot of times if I do all these warm-up sketches and pre-sketches, if I think, I gotta do this to make a good... I make it too big of a deal in my mind, and then it never gets done. So sometimes, because I know me, um, sometimes I just have to jump in and start drawing and, and, and finish a project instead of um, delaying and putting off and procrastinating. That's why I like sketches and pen drawings, because they're quick and to the point. I can just tell a story and be done. I don't really like to spend a lot of time rendering and fleshing everything out and getting hyper-realistic. I just like simple stories. I like communicating with my drawing and people can look at it and say, oh, nice. And then that's it. It's, it's, it's clear and it's effective. Sometimes I ask myself, do I want to spend six hours on a drawing getting it hyper-realistic or do I want to spend three, three hours on two drawings and tell two different stories, you know? So that's one thing I like about quick sketches, quick ink drawings, and, and just finishing projects. Here's one of the most daunting parts, is when you get your sketch done and you have to start inking because you can't erase the ink. And what I've learned to do to, to try and not freak out is just say, you know what, if I mess up, it's okay. I'm either going to fix it or I'm going to just have an ugly drawing or something. I just, I have to tell myself it's okay to fail. I have to tell myself I am willing to screw this up and start over. I'm willing to start from scratch if I have to, if it comes to that. 
because that really gets the fear out of me and I can I can just say all right here we go and I just take a breath and I start putting down my inks as long as you have a pretty good um, pencil sketch it's really not that bad you can just carefully and slowly go over your lines and start inking and once the first line is down it gets a little bit easier to keep on going because because you've already taken that first step the really hard part is when you get to people's faces or those crucial moments where you don't want to screw this up and that's where I've got here with this little girl it's scary and so I decided to go back through instead of just a faceless skeletal structure I decided to start trying to flesh this face out with pencil so that I could have more confidence when I try to ink it. If it was an old ugly bad guy or something, like a 40 year old man that's supposed to be evil, I wouldn't care. I would just draw it and if he's ugly or grotesque or I mess him up, it wouldn't matter. But when it's a woman, supposed to be a pretty woman or it's a child, you want to get it right as best you can. So I decided to give myself a little boost of confidence, draw the, the face in pencil, and what I found was that it sucked. I was relieved that I didn't just start in with the ink pen because my first three or four passes were not very good. She had a big nose. Eventually I got the pencil work to where I thought it was okay. I just took a breath and I laid down my inks. And it turned out somewhat alright. I tried to keep a, th a few things in mind. It's a little girl, so I wanted her to have a round face, not, not chiseled or high cheekbones or anything. I just wanted it to be nice and round. And this is a small drawing, so there's not a lot of room for heavy detailing. I really just have to kind of imply things. So I just kind of drew these circular, ovular looking eyes, and I kind of insinuated that there's pupils in them, but it's a little cartoony, it's a little bit like a comic book or something. A lot of it just comes down to practicing over and over, draw people, draw people, draw people. I did the same thing with the teacher, I was nervous about the face, and so I just sketched it out with a pencil, tried a few times, didn't like it, erased, and tried again. And I actually wasn't super happy with the way it turned out. The eyes, I think, were okay, and the nose, and then I got to the mouth, and it, it was just a little frightening. <laughs> the lips just ended up being too big. And then I did the jawline beneath them, and everything just looked a little bit well, it looked a little mannish. She kind of has a manly jawline. She kind of has a big mouth. At that moment, I panicked a little bit inside and thought, do I get white out? Do I try to do this again? And I thought, I'm just going to keep on going. I hoped that when I flesh out the entire image, her face and the imperfections of her face would get lost in the, in the whole picture. Um, in the end, it did work out a little bit that way. It's not as noticeable that she's a little bit man looking. But um, I, it's one of those things that happens in every drawing where you're just like, I'm not completely happy with this, and I have to tell myself that's okay. I don't have to be 100% happy with every drawing I do, or else I would never finish a project. Sometimes I just have to say, it's done. It has its imperfections, but it's done. And the other thing is, people do look certain ways. This could just be how she looks. Maybe she just has a kind of a blocky jawline and a big mouth. That's That's just... The hand that God dealt her, I guess. In this case, I'm God, and I <laughs> it was literally my hand <laughs> that dealt this to her, but I'm sorry, instructor. I didn't mean to give you such a manly looking face and a big mouth. I decided to draw her hand up on the book, like I mentioned, like she's holding it open or something. So here it is up close. You can see the teacher is pretty masculine, but overall, I am pretty happy with it. I like the look of the piano and the keys in her hands and the child and everything. Drawing the back of the piano ended up pretty wonky. I, I really screwed it up. I, I didn't plan it out very well. I just thought I'll throw this in as an afterthought. And it was a little bit lazy on my part. I should have done better. It's just wonky perspective. And in the end, I ended up shading it all out as just a black back of the piano because I didn't like it at all. Once again kind of nervous about this face with this other beautiful lady off in the corner <sighs> so I just had to just take a breath and have at it I, I flushed it out a little bit with a pencil and then I started inking hoped for the best not just hoped for the best I do have enough experience that I have some confidence because of the Andrew Loomis books I know the proportions of a face I know how to get it in 3d 
It's just sometimes there's a slip up, as with the instructor's mouth, where you think, aw oh, man, can't go back and fix that. That's just one of those things. Oh, actually, there was, for this model, there were three references, because I took the outfit from one, I took the head and the hat from one, and then I had a third picture to get the shoes. I just typed in 1950s shoes and, and pulled out these kind of high heels. Once I put the mom on the couch, I generally try to, to keep in mind the environment around them so that it's all in perspective, but as I put her on the couch, I started to realize the couch perspective seemed a little off. I wasn't very happy with the way I eyeballed it. And so I ended up tilting it a little bit more when I did the inks, and I just used the pencil um, as a reference for what the couch structure looked like, but I actually re- I rotated it with my ink pen as I drew it. I didn't quite follow the guidelines perfectly. If this was a fancy illustration that I really wanted to be right, I probably would have had the pencil right in the first place, but if this arose, I probably would have redrawn the whole couch in perspective with the pencil before inking it. But since this is just a quick sketch, I decided I can, I'm, I'm confident enough that I can just start inking over this pencil um, and try and get the couch rotated a little bit. The baby was pretty straightforward. There's not much detail. It's a small body anyway, so there's not a lot of space to draw big long limbs and things. So I, I kind of insinuated a lot of things with the baby. I just quickly sketched out here's an arm, here's a sleeve, here's a shoe, here's a hat. You know, that hat, it's just two little shapes, really. It's not something that I had to think, how do I put this in 3D perspective? I just thought, it's a crooked hat. You just draw a blob here, and you draw a blob there for the bill, and you're done. Okay, so the mom and the toddler are finished. I kind of thought afterwards I should have made the toddler playing with a toy or something. He looks rather bored. I like these big window curtains because this is like what my grandma had. She had a big old living room window in her old house. And it had these parting curtains like this. So here's the line drawing finished up. And when I finished it, I thought I could add some shading. And that's yet another scary step. It's, it's one of the most frightening parts because once you start shading, you cannot stop until you're done. You can't shade part of the drawing and say, well, that's it. <laughs> it wouldn't look right. Spotting blacks and doing cross-hatching is something you really have to commit to. And it's scary because you could potentially ruin your entire drawing. For this one, I decided to keep it pretty simple. I decided to just do one light source coming from the window so all the shadows are on the right side. One thing to keep in mind is that if you do it right, shading your drawing and having good lighting is always a good payoff. Like, once you, when you get started, it's like, oh, what have I done? I've, I've committed to this thing that I can't stop now and I might ruin my drawing. But once you get done, if it's consistent and it, it's believable, it almost always looks better. And sometimes I get nervous, especially with spotting blacks, like with comic books, you know, where they do big, long, filled black areas. Because you lose a lot of detail. As I mentioned with the piano, I'm going to cover up this whole back of the piano with just black shading. And if you were doing like a noir comic or something where there's lots of heavy, heavy shading, just lots of just black everywhere, you lose a lot of details in the clothing, in the face, in, in whatever thing that you're shading. And sometimes it feels like you're undoing all of your work. Like, I just drew all this detail, I drew all of these lines, and now I'm just going to go over it in black because there's no light here. And that can be frustrating when you're doing it. But in the end, it almost always pays off. If you do a good kind of noir looking picture with heavy shading and you step back and look at it, it's very satisfying. It looks that much more impactful and dynamic. And really what you want the shadows to do is just weight this drawing down on the page so that it's, it's heavier. It's much more solidified. It looks less like an ink drawing and more like an image or an illustration. Shadows help take two-dimensional objects and really bring out the 3D aspect in them and make them look like they are in an environment together. In the end, when I was finished, I was glad I did the shading. I think I could take it even farther, but to be honest, I'm a little nervous to do it because I have to send this out to somebody and I don't want to ruin it. It's risks and reward. Are you going to take the gamble and do it? You just got to ask yourself, are you willing to potentially ruin your drawing? 
If I'm trying to do ink for a digital drawing, sometimes I'll cheat and make a copy of it because in that case the original ink doesn't matter. I want to send this one out as an original, but if I'm just going to put it on the computer, I'll make a photocopy of it to save my space, to save my work. It's kind of a checkpoint. And then if I screw it up, I can go back to my first one and make another photocopy of it, try it again, screw it up, make another photocopy. I have a save point to revert back to. That's a much more comfortable way of inking for me. But for this one, since I needed the original, I just thought we're just going to get in, we're going to do it. And then I decided to stop here with the basic shading and call it good. I hope that was enjoyable. Hope it was helpful. If you want to get in on these drawings, unless I decide to take it down at some point, there is a pledge level on my Patreon page where you can get one of these drawings. Or even multiple drawings if you want to stay at that pledge level. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.